album came apart. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Rotary Club of Madison. My name is Charles McClymonds, and I'm the club president. And it's so great to have you all here today on this beautiful summer day. It looks like concerts on the square will be happening tonight. I won't have to move them. I plan to be out there with a, a group of other Rotarian leaders, so you can look for us on the square. We're going to be across from Starbucks, so hope to see some of you out there tonight. Um, we are going to start with um, Darren Harris will lead us in singing America the Beautiful with Jeff Bartell on the piano. And following music, our guests will be introduced by Dave Uwinowski. Darren. This is your turn. Sing. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. For purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plains. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. And proud thy good with brotherhood. From sea to signing sea. Woo! We're going to do the Ray Charles version next. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. But we should. Thank you, Charles. And now Dave will introduce our guest. Thanks, Charles. It's my... My pleasure to introduce all of our guests and visitors today. We ask that you stand as your name is announced and remain standing so we can recognize the entire group. Alex Aderman is a guest of Scott Homerson. Peter Gray has two guests, Janine Bendel and Tanya Ibarra. Eric Crawford is a guest of Cheryl Cotto. Paul Gessner, a guest of Neil Fauerbach. Kevin Kennedy here as part of the program committee. Cristobal Martinez, a guest of Aurelia Estrada. Melissa Radcliffe with Charles Tubbs. Jennifer Winding, we're expecting, a guest of Bob Winding. Donna Wickey, a guest of Cheryl Wickey. Lori Zuckerman, guest of Karen Kedrick Hands and Larry Hands. Angela Hawkins, guest of D. Fleury Simmons. Sabrina Madison, a guest of Anthony Gray. And we are expecting four visiting Rotarians. I'm not sure if they're here yet. Marsha Brandt from Davenport, Iowa. Terry Hawthorne from Beaumont, Texas. Patricia Prudhomme from Lake Charles, Louisiana, and Tim Self from Anderson, South Carolina. Welcome to all of our visitors and guests. Welcome to our guests and visitors. During my president year, I'm asking one member each week to provide a moment of rotary gratitude. And uh, this week, um, uh, yeah, Carol Kobe did a great job last week, didn't she? Um, meet, sharing the story, meeting her husband. Um, today's moment of gratitude will be presented by Scott Strong. Scott is executive director of RISE Wisconsin and joined our Rotary Club in 2008. He just completed a two-year term on our Rotary Board of Directors and also is the immediate past chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Scott. Thank you, President Charles. And yes, I am not going to follow in the footsteps of Carol. She did an outstanding job last week, and I have nothing that compelling. Um, <laughs> not even one story as compelling as one of her stories. So, But anyway, when I think of Rotary, I think of three things. I think of opportunities to engage with new members and within Rotary. I think of youth, and I think of belonging. Um, so opportunities to engage. So last week, as Charles just mentioned, I had just come off a two-year stint on the board, just finished two years as co-chair of the DNI committee, and I was breathing a little sigh of relief. 
And then Pat saw me as I was doing my greeter duty last week and said, are you enjoying the, the peace and quiet and the free time? I said, absolutely. Um, I said, but there probably will be another opportunity that's going to come my way soon, just the way things go. Within two days, Pat emailed me and asked if I would come up to the podium and speak about my experience as a member. So the opportunities are there. And of course, you always have the opportunity to decline. And I appreciate being asked and enjoy the opportunity to say yes. Um, with regard to youth, since joining uh, the Rotary Club in 2008, I've been a member of the uh, Youth Awards Committee. Um, I co-chaired or I chaired it for a couple years, and given the work that I do at Rise Wisconsin, working with children, youth, and families with mental health uh, concerns, um, having a club that is um, committed to the, the better betterment of youth in our community was really important to me. It's one of the passions that I bring and one of the things that keeps me really engaged in, in Rotary. Um, what we do through the youth awards, the scholarships, ethics symposium, um, that all makes a difference in our community and it makes a difference to youth. So thank you, for Rotary, for that. And finally, belonging. Um, I was really appreciative in 2013 when the d &I committee was formed within Rotary. It was a response to the uh, Race to Equity report that came out, which um, was not, um, um, did not show, show a very kind light on Madison and Dane County. Um, the disparities that we experience here for people of color are um, atrocious. And so having a Rotary Club that would build off its values, um, where all feel a sense of belonging, and recognizing that what it means to belong isn't the, isn't the same for everyone. Um, and forming a DNI committee to grow and learn in that space is really important. So um, the work is not easy, it's challenging, but I appreciate that Rotary is out in front uh, leading some of that charge among other service clubs, um, both um, locally and throughout the state and probably even nationally. So having a uh, Rotary club that is committed to having an inclusive and equitable environment is really also a very important important to me and keeps me coming back. So there are other reasons why I belong, but those are the three main ones, um, and I appreciate uh, being a member of this club. Thank you. Our club second century fellowship group helps us with the promotion of our annual Bring a Child or Grandchild to Rotary Day. And uh, you don't have to have a child, just go out and get a child. Uh, you know, it can be your neighbor's child, a friend's child, you know, just a child to, to Rotary. So, and um, Aurelia Estrada chairs this year's Second Century Fellowship Group, and she's going to come up and tell us more about this special event. Aurelia, bienvenida. Gracias, Presidente. President means president. <laughs> um, hello, uh, greetings to everyone. Hola a todos. I am so excited to be here. Um, I haven't been here in probably over a month. Um, so Scott said belonging, and that's what I experience every time that I come to Rotary. So thank you for always making me feel welcome. But I'm not here to talk about that. Um, show of hands, how many of you ever play with a yo-yo? Yes. So um, Rotary, uh, we are celebrating our sixth annual Bring Your Child, Grandchild, or Adult Child to Rotary Day on Wednesday, August 23rd. Um, we are going to be featuring uh, the World Yo-Yo Champion. So I really hope that you guys are able to bring your child, grandchild. Um, it should be a really great time. Um, I was here last year, and it's a blast, and I get to spend some time with my five-year-old. So please join us. Thank you, Aureli. And Melanie, Melanie Ramey is past president of our club, and she took on the role once again for another year as our meeting sponsorship chair. <laughs> Now, can you hear me? <laughs> Whether you want to or not. Um, as Charles said, we're in our third year of having the luncheons sponsored. Now then, some of you have been receiving emails from me, uh, and some of you have never responded, which I might mention. Uh, but this is for a worthy cause, and I want to clear up 
one thing, and that is that the checks are not made out to me personally, unfortunately, uh, but they are for the good of the club. And it's one of the ways that we can keep from having to raise our dues. As you know, we took quite a hit in the pandemic, and we were able to continue to operate at full speed, although we had a lot less money coming in. Uh, and since then, of course, like every place else, our costs have all increased considerably. So that's really why we're doing this. Now then, if you would prefer not to get an email from me, and I can imagine that's about half of the room, uh, on your table today is a green piece of paper. And it explains all the many benefits of sponsoring a luncheon. And you can put your name on it and either drop it at the desk out there or give it to me personally, and this will solve a lot of problems. I won't have to write you 20 times. I can just write you once. Uh, so this is really a very helpful kind of thing. And we all have a dog in this fight. And one of the things to know is that some groups are more creative than others. For example, some of the committees have sponsored a lunch, and that honestly spreads the cost around considerably. Some of the fellowship groups have sponsored lunches, and that also spreads the cost around. So if you are chair of a committee or chair of a fellowship group, think about that. And even a group who, uh, of, of members who have graduated from the University of Illinois approached me, and they're going to, <laughs> and they're going to sponsor the week before the Wisconsin Illinois game. See, yay. And I'm sure they will be dressed appropriately for the occasion. So be creative about this. Now, I also want to give an update uh, on my last announcement. Uh, in February, as you know, I announced that I had lost Mark Green, and I had been trying to find him anywhere. He hadn't been in the obituaries. He hadn't been deployed by the Army, and I couldn't find him any place. Well, I did find him. Uh, he was wandering the square one day, and I ran in, almost ran into him. That was my original thought, running over him. But I decided that would not be a very Rotarian thing to do, as it would not build better friendships, and it would not benefit all concerned, especially him. And so I just approached him very subtly and said, why haven't you been responding to my emails? And so he was quite surprised, of course, and unhappy to see me, I'm sure. Uh, but anyhow, he dragged out his telephone and looked in it, and for the first time in five years, in the spam file, and there I was, all 20 emails. So he said, if you will uh, write me another email, and update this, then I'll respond. So the next day, wrote him an email. He wrote me back, miracles still happen. He said, got to check with somebody, I'll get back to you on Tuesday. Six weeks ago, and Tuesday has never come. Uh, so I just want to tell you that this job involves all kinds of things. So what I have done is I'm referring him to the VA. I, I, I checked with the VA, and they have classes on uh, time management and uh, on how to use your electronic devices. And uh, I then also asked them, when he comes over there, do you have some of these little free calendars with days of the week on them? They said yes, and they all have Tuesday. So in any event, we'll see how that works out. But I just want you to know that this is a complicated job. I'm working hard at it, and I appreciate your help. And you can certainly come up to me today and say, oh, Melanie, I just am sorry you haven't called me yet, but I want to do this. Or if you don't want to talk to me, fill out this green piece of paper, and I'll be forever grateful. Thank you. Oh, no. Okay, we're back. We're back live again. Thank you, Melanie. One of, one of the most effective ways that Melanie recruits people is at the Luhan and Scotch Whiskey events. You know, that happened to me. So um, that's a very effective way of recruiting, Melanie. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have birthdays to celebrate with a bit of humor or wisdom that complements our Rotary mission. We also encourage members to make a gift to our Foundation's Community Grants Endowment Fund that represents their age rounded up to 100 for our Synergy Scholarship Fund. On July 16th, it's Joe Luenas. Uh, July 17th, Michael Mucha says, there are three truths, my truth, your truth, and the truth. July 17th, Ward Pike.
July 17th, John Sims. July 21st, Tina Choles. July 21st, Scott Halmerson. July 21st, past President Dave Molenhoff. July 22nd, Sean Carney. July 22nd, Abby Corso. Thanks to our celebrants for their contributions to the Madison Rotary Foundation Community Grants Endowment Fund. Please join me in wishing them a happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rotarians. Happy birthday to you. And we have members in the news. Rhonda Adams was interviewed on NBC Channel 15 about the River Food Pantry's new munch truck delivering free food without stigma. Christy Goforth was quoted in an article in Madison 365 about free, free bikes for kids, Madison's first annual Southside slow roll coming up on August 5th. Joe Lowenus was quoted in a Wisconsin State Journal article about three consecutive weeks of concerts on the square being postponed, not this week, Joe, okay? <laughs> Uh, Connor Moran was interviewed on NBC Channel 15 about the Madison Public Library Foundation celebrating its 30th anniversary on July 11th. And Christian Overland was also interviewed on NBC Channel 15 about the Wisconsin Historical Society's new history center. And congratulations to member Valerie Rank, who has recently renounced her retirement as CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Dane County. This was noted in InBusiness.com last week. Congratulations, Valerie, on moving towards retirement. <laughs> See, I, Professor Brower, we run a tight meeting. I'm, I'm running ahead of schedule, actually, so you're going to have some extra time. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Marcus Brower who received his PhD in psychology from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Dr. Brower is currently a psychology professor and executive director of the Institute for Diversity Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His areas of research include group and intergroup processes, and he has authored more than 80 articles and chapters. As a social psychologist, he develops and tests interventions aimed at changing people's behaviors in a variety of domains, such as diversity, energy consumption, and workplace behaviors. The title of his presentation today is How to Change Behaviors in Diversity. We look forward to your presentation, Dr. Brower, and we have made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way of saying thanks for speaking with us today. I wanted to mention that we will also have Q&A with our speaker at the, end of, uh, at the end of his talk, but please wait until someone brings the microphone to you, and remember to follow the Rotary four-way test for asking questions. Dr. Brower. Thank you. Thank you for this kind introduction. Uh, I prepared another slide sort of telling what I do. Most of it was just said, I'm a social psychologist. I'm in the psychology department. I'm affiliated with both the Wisconsin School of Business and the School of Medicine and Public Health. And finally, I'm the executive director of the Institute for Diversity Science. I want to point out that number one, the institute chair of the Institute for Diversity Science is Dr. Angela Bias Winston, who unfortunately was not able to be here today. Here is what my collaborators and I study. We study how to promote good behaviors, and we do that in a variety of domain. One domain is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Another has to do with pro-environmental behaviors and how to reduce people's carbon footprint. And finally, we look at counterproductive workplace behaviors or organizational citizenship behaviors. And um, the People sometimes ask me, isn't it impossible to change people's behaviors? Isn't that incredibly hard? And I say, yeah, it's hard, but it's possible. We can do it. But the problem is that most people use terribly ineffective methods to change other people's behaviors. Um, and sort of the second take home message that I want to give you for today is there's actually research, empirical research, scientific research in what we call behavioral sciences. And that research has contributed a lot in the last 10 to 20 years. And we now know so much more how we can change behaviors. And that's what I'm going to share with you in the next uh, minutes. OK, here, a little bit of audience participation. I have a multiple choice question for you. Here is uh, Bill. Bill is holding his recycling bin. 
What is the easiest way to get Bill to increase his recycling volume? And you have three options. Please, um, I'm going to ask for a show of hands, but let me first present what the possible answers are. A is I convince Bill that climate change is caused by human beings. B, I highlight that there are more and more natural disasters in his geographical area. C, I give him a different recycling bin. Good, I hear C, and that is the correct answer, because all I have to do to get change, to get uh, Bill to change his recycling behavior is give him a bigger bin. I have at that point not changed his attitudes towards climate change. I have not raised awareness about the devastating consequences of climate change. All I do is I give Bill a bigger recycling bin. Even better if that recycling bin is green, which is not what's on the picture. And you know what is the second most effective method? If you leave the recycling bin out in the street longer, then people see that their neighbors are recycling and then they are going to recycle more. So in areas where the recycling bins are picked up later, people actually recycle more than in areas where the recycling bins are picked up earlier. Again, this is behavior change, and at that point, we have not yet changed people's beliefs about climate change or people's attitudes towards the importance of protecting the natural environment. I want to address a number of false beliefs today. For me, one of the false beliefs is that we can change behaviors by providing information and raising awareness. And I want to point out to you one example here. Is it has been shown that people with regard to climate change can be grouped into six different categories depending on what they think and how concerned they are about climate change and how serious they think the consequences are. The two groups that are the most concerned are called alarmed and concerned. Well, it turns out that these people do not engage in more pro-environmental behaviors than the other four groups. It's not that they fly less, it's not that they eat less meat, and it's not that they recycle more. It's not that they use more alternative means of transportation. So what we have is we have people's attitudes, people concerned, people are anxious, and yet these behaviors, these attitudes, these feelings do not translate into the corresponding behaviors. And the question is why? Why is that? Well, there are several explanations. The French social psychologist Robert Vincent Joulet said, good ideas do not necessarily lead to good behaviors. There is a term, a technical term, we call it the value action gap. Let me talk to you what that is, the value action gap. Okay, you know it. If you ask people, hey, what do you think about donating blood? Is, is that a great idea to, to donate blood? Yeah, it's a great idea. Are you donating your blood? No, nah, I'm not really donating. <laughs> okay, what about working out? And I have some slides coming up. Here's what we all should do. The guidelines by CDC are quite clear, right? We should be engaging in 2.5 hours of physical activity per week. It should be moderate intensity aerobic activity. And finally, it should be in bouts of about 10 minutes or more. If we go around and ask people, do you think this is a good idea to do that? Would, would that be a good thing for you to do that? They say, yeah, 80%. Say, yeah, that would be a wonderful idea. I, I, I should be doing that. If we now ask people, hey, are you actually doing that? Are you going out and getting 150 minutes of exercise per year? Well, it drops to 40%. 40% are saying, yep, oh, I'm doing that. I'm going out. But what happens when you put these little devices on people's ankles <laughs> that measure how much physical activity they actually get? 4%. That is the value action gap. 80% of the people think it's a great idea. 4% are actually doing it. Right? And that is in so many domains. Uh, you tell smokers that smoking causes lung cancer. It's not going to change their smoking behavior. And in so many different domains, we find that there's a huge gap between what people value and what they think is a good idea to do and what they actually do. The reasons are multiple ones. It could be lack of time. We have other constraints. There are situational pressures. And especially most of us have so many other things to do, right? There are so many issues to take care of, to advocate for, that uh, maybe going out and donating blood is not top on our priority list. That was false belief number one. False belief number one is if you give people information and raise awareness, you're going to change their behavior. Raising awareness and giving information probably won't hurt, and in some cases, they actually help, but they're in most cases not enough to get people to change their behaviors.
Oops. Now I got, I think the battery is getting weak. I can just, I, I can try and this is perfect. Thank you. I can't tell you when to move forward if this doesn't work. Okay, belief number two. Well, if many other people are doing it, if many institutions are implementing a particular program or a particular initiative, then that probably means it's a really good one and it's really effective. Well, I'm sorry, that is entirely incorrect and there's a great, there's a great book by uh, Tim Wilson and that book uh, is called Redirect and Redir Tim Wilson reviews all the programs that exist uh, that are out there in a variety of domain and he shows a variety of things. Uh, first of all, most of the initiatives, even those that are implemented on a national level, are not evaluated. And then if you start evaluating, evaluating them, you actually find out that many of them are either ineffective and some of them even counterproductive. And he reviews different types of programs. Some are aimed at reducing juvenile delinquency, teenage pregnancy, DARE, the drug program, diversity initiatives. And it turns out that one after the next, even though they're implemented on a large scale, these initiatives turn out to be ineffective and sometimes counterproductive. Like teenage pregnancy, there's one particular program. Those in the treatment condition who were exposed to the program actually became pregnant at a higher rate than those who were not exposed to the program, right? That is um, what happens to some of these programs. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, let's look at diversity because that's um, what I was asked to talk about today. Here's an article by Frank Dobbin, who is a sociologist at Harvard University. Ex Alexandra Caliph is in Israel, um, Haifa University. And these two researchers examined the following thing. What happens in a particular company five years after a specific diversity initiative has been implemented? And especially what they looked at, what is the number of male and female individuals belonging to various ethnic groups five years after a particular diversity initiative has been implemented. Here are the results. Let me walk you through. In row one of that table, you have uh, mandatory diversity training. So if you look at what happens in that row, uh, five years after mandatory diversity training has been introduced, what you see is 9.2% fewer it's negative. Fewer black women are in management leadership positions. The same is true with Asian men and women. Five years after the mandatory diversity training introduced, what you see in these companies are about 5% fewer Asian men and women in leadership positions. The same is true with other uh, initiatives that have been proposed to address diversity issues, standardized job tests, grievance system, etc. The take home message here is not that mandatory diversity training is necessarily bad. There are some that are really good and there are some that are really bad. What I'm showing is that on average, especially diversity training that is not administered by people who are knowledgeable about the topic, but who do this because in order to make money, uh, can sometimes be counterproductive. It can lead to fewer um, women and ethnic minorities in leadership positions. Next slide. False belief number three. If you sort of know people, you're somebody who understands other people, you have good intuition, you have common sense, then you also know how to change behaviors. I'm sorry, this is entirely wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to treat cancer, you need to be a trained oncologist. And if you want to make informed statements about human behavior, I'm sorry, you need to be a trained behavioral scientist. And I'm going to try to make that point uh, on, on the next slide here. So here's Carla. Carla, we just got her to buy an electric car. I don't know, some rebate program or some tax reduction, whatever. So Carla bought an electric car. So now I'm asking you, after buying that electric car, will Carla be more likely or less likely to engage in other pro-environmental behaviors? When I, what I mean by that is she's buying energy efficient light bulbs. Is she going to eat less red meat, et cetera, after buying her electric car? Your options are, she's more likely, she's less likely, or we can't say. The correct answer is again, C. And the reason is, there are actually two possibilities. One, the technical term is called positive spillover. In that case, Carla says to herself, huh, I just bought an electric car. 
What does that mean? Oh, that means I'm probably caring about the environment. I'm an environmentalist. I'm somebody who does something for the future of our planet. And given that that is who I am, oh, let me go and let me engage in other pro-environmental behaviors. Let me go ahead and buy that energy efficient light bulb. But there's also a second possibility. It's called negative spillover. In that case, Carla is saying, okay, I bought, just bought an electric car. I'm done. I've done my deed. I've contributed to what I have to do. I can now go ahead and, in that case, eat my burger, which contains beef, uh, et cetera. Uh, the second effect is sometimes referred to as moral licensing. I, I'm done. I've done my deed. I'm done here. Uh, imagine that a measly in the diversity domain. Well, okay, I went to that one diversity event. Now I'm done, right? We, we've done. Companies implement one diversity initiative, diversity training. Oh, we're done. We're done. We have done our deed. We can move on. Anyway, so uh, what I'm, the argument I'm trying to make, first of all, if you're a behavioral scientist, you know that these two outcomes are possible, especially you know what to do to create a communication strategy that either is likely to lead to positive spillover or to negative spillover. So with the right messaging, you can actually shape people's psychological processes that are either related to consistency and identity effects on the left side or that are related to moral licensing on the right side. Okay. Let me um, come to the topic of behaviors in, in the domain of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I sort of wrote in smaller letters what sort of the question is, how do we change people's behaviors, right? Because that's the goal. That's um, the experience of members of marginalized groups is primarily shaped, is by the way, how other people treat them and behave towards them, not so much, but in other people's heads. So uh, there's that focus on behavior. And then how do we get people to behave in a less discriminatory manner and in a more inclusive manner? And that is an incredibly important topic. Um, we will have a worker shortage, as you know, by 2030. Wisconsin companies have to do something to create inclusive workplace climates, have to do something to attract job applicants uh, who are members of marginalized groups, both from in-state and both from uh, other states. Uh, Wisconsin businesses, especially small companies in rural Wisconsin, and I often get invited to talk to like the Chamber of Commerce, um, um, Sheboygan, Beaver Dam, et cetera. And the, the, here, we, what, we, what I have is small business owners and what they want to know, what can they do differently to attract candidates and to, to retain, most importantly, recruit and retain members of marginalized groups into their workforce. What can they do to create inclusive workplace climates? And that is an incredibly important question, uh, both for moral and ethical reasons, but also for the future of Wisconsin businesses. So that is a crucial question uh, that I'm going to address now. So here's the question. How do we get people to act in a less discriminatory and more inclusive manner? And you can, um, I'm going to give you three options, but by now you can probably guess what my, what my answer is going to be. Um, do we raise awareness about implicit biases? Do we inform them that discrimination is still existing and has negative consequences for members of marginalized groups? Or finally, do we use insights from the behavioral sciences? And I don't need the answer. You know it's C that I'm going to propose. OK. So what works? How do we create inclusive workplace climates, both at the workplace, but also in educational settings? The first thing that works is a structured, systematic approach. And that is something that draws from a variety of disciplines, uh, from psychology to behavioral economics. Most public health campaigns are based on this structured, systematic approach. And then there is the discipline of social marketing that is specifically an entire discipline that is designed. How do we get people uh, to change their behaviors that are uh, beneficial for themselves, but also beneficial for society and for other people? And um, this is now a one-hour talk that I'm reducing to 30 seconds. What you need in that structured um, systematic approach, you need to be very clear about four things. First of all, what is, are the behaviors that you would like to change? And they differ. They differ from one setting to the next. So you need to identify in a given setting what is the behavior that you want people to adopt. Finally, who is your target audience? Whose behaviors do you want to change? What are the barriers and benefits? What prevents members of the target audience currently from engaging in the behavior in which you want them to engage in? And finally, what are benefits? What are things that you could highlight that would get them 
to engage in these behaviors? What would have to change so that members of your target audience engage in the desired behaviors? And finally, what we call the four Ps, the place, price, promotion, and, and product, is, has to do with where do you implement it? What are the motivational incentive structure? Uh, what is the actual product? Is it a brochure? Is it a poster? Is it a workshop, et cetera? And finally, who promotes it? All these are very conscious choices. And only, uh, and they have to do, they often require background research, with, both with members of marginalized groups and with members of non-marginalized groups to understand what these barriers and benefits are. If you adopt this type of systematic approach, um, you are likely to see effects in the diversity domain. Uh, what works? Number two, uh, one of the most powerful things is to change people's perceptions of social norms. And the reason is that social norms are one of the primary determinants of human behavior. And I want to give you an example of a study. It was a study that was conducted in Canada. So these researchers, they took a video recording of a, co a comedian, and they made sure that after each of the jokes, there was canned laughter in that video recording. And they asked participants to watch that video recording. But there were two versions of the video recording. Um, actually, in both versions, at some point, that comedian made a joke that was offensive against a marginalized ethnic group. And, but there were two versions. In one version, there was the canned laughter right after that joke. In the other version, there was dead silence after that joke. So it was a, a, a comedy show at a, at a university, et cetera. And, and it was presented as having taken place at the students' university themselves. And immediately after that, they measured a number of outcomes. Well, the students, the participants who saw the comedian, and there was, no, there was dead silence after that offensive joke, they had very different attitudes towards diversity, towards members of other groups. They were more likely uh, to report wanting to engage in inclusive behaviors. They were more likely to support the campus initiatives uh, to promote diversity initiatives, et cetera. So there was a strong support, and they condemned any kind of offensive behavior stronger. And that is exactly what, I'm, what, what the social norms approach is about. Um, if we can change people's perceptions what is normative and what is acceptable, they will change their behavior from one day to the next. You may have a person who was part of a company and there was a certain company culture, and let's say there was that effeminate imitation of a gay man, and then everybody laughed about it. Well, they go to the next company, they make that same thing, that effeminate imitation of a gay man, nobody is laughing. That person will change their behavior from one day to the next. We do not have to change that person's implicit biases against gay and gay men and lesbians, but I can change their behaviors uh, by, by changing their perceptions of what social norms are, what people around them do. I want to give you another example of how that works. So we at the university here, we conducted a study in university classrooms, and we exposed students at the beginning of the year to one of three videos. Um, classrooms were randomly assigned to one of these three conditions. One was our social norms video. And the goal of that social norms video was to show, hey, this is a campus where people care about diversity and inclusion. This is a campus where people try at least to behave in an inclusive manner. And this is what it looked like. And I'm too bad that my clicker. Anyway, these are young students who were being interviewed, many of them. And they said things like that they're not yet. They care about diversity. Uh, they are part of a multicultural learning community. They work in a lab addressing diversity. Then there's a young African-American man. He says his eyes were open towards a variety of groups that he wasn't very familiar with. Uh, then again, another student said how much they valued diversity. And then on the right side, I, I, you may have briefly seen the pictures, there were a number of experts who reported the results of empirical studies that suggested, yes, there's widespread support for the university's pro-diversity initiative. There um, people enjoy the diversity on campus and uh, would like to see more of it, et cetera. At the very end, there was a sentence that at, at UW-Madison, we value diversity and we embrace people from all backgrounds in our community. The goal was to communicate, hey, this is a campus where diversity and inclusion are core values that are broadly endorsed by the members of the campus community. Uh, let me show you the, and then we measured outcomes at the end of the semester, 12 to 13 weeks uh, later. So here are the results by the um, 
respondents belonging to marginalized ethnic groups. And next slide. What you have in blue is students who were in classrooms in which we showed our social norms video. And then there was a bias video, uh, and then there was a no exposure control condition in light gray. If you look at the blue bars, um, students from marginalized groups who were in classrooms in which we showed our social norms video reported a more positive social climate, an enhanced sense of belonging. They reported better phys physical health. And more importantly for us, they reported to us that their peers treated them with um, more positively and in a more respectful and in a more inclusive manner. Social norms is incredibly effective in changing people's behavior. Next slide. This was just one study. Here I'm showing you that we then replicated that uh, across five experiments in a variety of settings. And what we always find, regardless of whatever indicator of inclusive climate we use, we find that um, people who were exposed to a social norms mes message related to diversity, equity, and inclusion reported having a more positive experience compared to those in other classrooms. We even reduced the achievement gap. Uh, so what you have is in gray, you have the no exposure control condition. You have the typical gap in grades between members of privileged groups and members of marginalized groups. If you now see what happens in the blue bars, uh, which is the classrooms in which we showed our social norms video, you see that that achievement gap is entirely eliminated. And there is, you no longer see a difference in grades between members of privileged and members of marginalized groups. Okay, let me wrap this up and then open up for questions. Um, um, this is my last slide. So the, the, the big question of, of, of this talk today was, how do we change behaviors to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion? Me take home message number one, don't limit yourself to providing information and raising awareness because in most cases, this is not enough. The fact that a particular DEI initiative is implemented in many, many companies doesn't mean that it necessarily works. And if there is somebody in your company who proposes to implement a particular pro-diversity initiative, I think it is fair to ask, what is the evidence that that initiative produces the desired outcomes? I would advise to work with DEI professionals and behavior change experts if that is your goal. Uh, because working with them pays off, you actually will produce the desired effects. For example, you can contact the Institute for Diversity Science, and we have a whole list of experts who study that empirically, who are scientists who study that empirically. If you have, if your company has extra money and you would like to get rid of it, we'd be happy to help you solve that problem. Uh, if you want to donate to the Institute for Diversity Science, there's a donate button. Feel free to help us with our research. And I do want to mention that there are two people in this room who already donated, and I'm very grateful to them. Thank you. Finally, uh, I briefly pointed out there's a much longer literature on social norms that probably shifting societal standards, shifting social norms is a lever that has been underexploited. And if we succeed in changing people's perceptions of what the social norms are around diversity and inclusion, behavior change will follow. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes. Thank you, doctor. We very much appreciate you coming to talk to us. I am not a behavioral scientist, but I do happen to have been a black man for 52 years. Um, I slightly disagree that it's been underutilized. The so kind of social capital has been underutilized to change behavior. I think it's been used in reverse. I think it's what makes um, overtly and openly racist behavior from senior leadership so frightening is because it grants social permission for the slugs to come out from under their rocks because it's no longer socially unacceptable to say or do certain things. In other words, 
yes, it can change behavior for the positive, but it can have the exact opposite effect if that's the way it's being used. Thank you. I entirely agree with you. There is abundant literature showing that leadership endorsement is absolutely crucial to the effectiveness of pro-diversity initiatives. Unless you have leadership endorsement, you can do as many workshops as you want or implement as many pro-diversity initiatives as you want. They're not going to be effective. Actually, I worked, uh, I lived in France for many years and I worked with headquarters of Michelin Tires and their DEI office. And what Michelin Tires did, they recorded a two minute video with the CEO and the CEO made it very clear Diversity, equity, and inclusion are core values of our companies. This is what we stand for. This is who we are. Michelin Tires is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And not only is this a moral and ethical question, diversity, equity, and inclusion also helps us achieve our business objectives. In that case, they make tires. They say, we're going to be more innovative. We're going to be more productive. People are going to enjoy more. People, uh, they're greater job satisfaction, and we're going to have reduced turnover among employees from marginalized groups. So diversity, equity, and inclusion are not something that we sort of add on because it makes us look nice. That's our, our core values of our company, and um, that's who we stand for, and it helps us achieve our business objective. So I entirely agree. It can be used both ways, and if somehow the social norms, it becomes acceptable to make this choice, um, we have a problem. But this is why it is so incredibly important to have both the leadership endorsement, but also other people speaking up and immediately doing something about it. In my department, I often talk about issues related to sexual harassment. Uh, don't let it go. If, if there's any incident that makes you feel uncomfortable, if, if any instructor ever says something that makes you, that you find offensive or you feel uncomfortable, do something about it because it's the letting it go. It's the not saying anything. Uh, that is more detrimental than, 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 than other things. Thank you. Uh, fascinating information, Doctor. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, to your section on how these great PR headline campaigns end up actually being ineffectual once measured, are we seeing any progress in the conceivers and administrators of these programs taking that into account and actually improving those programs, or are they more, still more concerned with the headlines versus the results? No, I think we're slowly getting there. There, there, there is a shift, and, and including, I mean, I see the shift mostly in the diversity of domain. I think for many, many years, we just did stuff without really worrying whether the stuff that we did had the desired effects. And now more and more people are going out and saying, we have to test this, we have to find out if these initiatives are effective. So I think even in the other domains, uh, partly to Tim Wilson's book that I presented to you, people are now going out and actually doing the work that should have been done 20 years ago, which is okay. Let's first implement it at a small scale. Let's see if it works. And if effectiveness has been demonstrated on a smaller scale, then let's go ahead and roll it out uh, on a national scale. And I think in the educational sciences, you see that a lot. I think there was a lot of intuition, teacher, teaching practices, et cetera. Now we have switched nearly entirely to evidence-based teaching practices. What are practices that increase student learning? And I think there is a shift in many other domains as well, including the diversity main, which I think is the right thing. The middle of your program um, slides, there was a slide that had a bunch of literature on it, and one of the one of the books or pamphlets had a N polio no, um, now indicator on it. Is there a story behind it, or did you just stick that there because you were going to a Rotary Club meeting? <laughs> no, I took that slide. It, it says at the bottom. I don't even know what that is um, in the top right corner. I remember I looked at that this morning and said, "What is that?" No, I think the full reference is at the bottom of, of that slide. No, and I did not add it specifically <laughs> for the Rotary Club. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question regarding artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence can be used for good or evil. We know that. Uh, and it's being used in changing behavior uh, and manipulating people's uh, opinions. Uh, what do you think the future of artificial intelligence in changing behavior will be? And what are the guardrails? It's a great question. I think it's an opportunity, 
but I think we have to be very careful how we use artificial intelligence. There's now an increasing number of studies that show that these algorithms, Airbnb, et cetera, actually produce discrimination. There are algorithms of street cameras, et cetera, who seem to automatically pick up when there's a problem. Well, it has been shown that the way they are programmed uh, disproportionately affects individuals uh, from marginalized ethnic groups. So we have to be incredibly careful how these algorithms and how artificial intelligence is created and programmed. And we, again, we need the behavioral scientists to study if any of them have um, biases that are built into these algorithms and therefore are counterproductive. I think it, it's, it's definitely an opportunity. Thank you. Um, sorry. I'm curious about, uh, I was thinking about your uh, example in terms of the uh, office or the different, different ways the uh, workspaces respond to diversity issues. And it, it, it made me think about social norms or social, uh, not social norms, but social reference groups. And I'm wondering in, in your research, uh, where uh, does social referencing group uh, come up as an important predictor of change? Because um, I'm, I'm even thinking about just being a, a black male. And so in situations uh, where uh, just importance and imp uh, just uh, the importance of the thing uh, matters more uh, based off someone's social location, their identity, and things like that. And so I'm wondering if people of, when we're thinking about changing perceptions and changing um, social norms, does the social group or the reference group matter? Uh, I think that was a long-winded way of saying no. that. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great question, Eric. Um, reference group are incredibly important. There's one great study by Betsy Palog at Yale University. She actually recruited uh, sort of opinion leaders in, in, in classrooms and in a high school and worked with them to reduce offensive behaviors and to speak up. Uh, when they observe uh, offensive behaviors, and that was incredibly effective, uh, her intervention. Reference groups are also important in the systematic structured approach that I mentioned, and this is where it is interesting. Uh, who is my target audience? Sometimes my target audience is white individuals who are sort of middle of the road, right? They're not the super egalitarians, and they're not the super racist, but they are sort of middle of the road. Maybe these are individuals who have a little bit of what we call inner group anxiety. They feel uncomfortable talking to members of different social and ethnic groups. Um, they feel they don't know what to say. They're afraid of saying the wrong things, et cetera. And therefore, they stay away. And then you have that social distancing that members of marginalized groups report um, so often. So the important question here is when, I, when this is my target audience, who is their referent group? And uh, who, who, who would they listen to? Who are they influenced by? And how do I do that? Well, with my systematic structured approach, I actually need to get them uh, into a, a focus group, and I need to get them in a room, and I need to ask them, OK, well, uh, who, who, are, who, who's, who are you looking up to when you look for behavioral guidance, right? And that may not be the same referent groups as the super egalitarians and the super racists, right? So we actually do that a lot. We have we, we convene different types of focus groups. Uh, we usually start out with members of marginalized groups because what we're asking them is about the target behavior and the target audience, right? So what are the behaviors around here that need to change for you to feel welcome and included and respected? Tell us instances where you did not feel included, and then how can we change that? What are the instances where you felt uh, respected? And then we ask, okay, so who are these people? Are these colleagues, coworkers on the factory floor? Are these middle management, or is, the, is this the staff, the administrative staff? So who, who is it? Whose behaviors should we be working on? And after we've asked members of marginalized groups and found out what our target behavior is and who our target audience is, then we actually go to our target audience and we try to understand what their barriers and benefits are, including who their reference groups are. Because maybe in terms of promotion, the 4P, well, I want my campaign to be promoted by somebody who's part of the reference group of my target audience. So it's a great question. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for helping us connect the dots between changing minds around climate change and changing minds around diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, Rotarians are into action, and I want to can you tell us what your call to action would be around this shifting social norms? I think you need a clear statement by the president because you need, <laughs> you need leadership endorsement. But you also have to visibly show 
that you care. You need a DEI. I mean, I don't know if you're talking about Rotary or if you're talking about organization. We talk a lot about organizations. You need a DEI committee. You need a, a vice president for DEI. That person needs to have staff. That person needs to have time to work on it. They need to need office space. They need to have resources. Uh, you need a diversity statement on your web page. You need to show that you care about this topic. You need to show that it's not just a public uh, thing that you say, but that you actually follow through. Uh, corporate social responsibility, recruitment effort, active recruiting in areas uh, where there are members of marginalized groups, and then onboarding. How do you help career development, uh, et cetera? So there's a lot you can do in organizations, and it's more than just having one statement, um, hey, we care about diversity. Thank you. Th <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brower. That's uh, fascinating. And uh, next time you show that slide with the end polio now, uh, you can tell them that the, the Rotary Club of Madison made a contribution in your name because you spoke here today to the Polio Plus Fund. <laughs> so now you know. All right. And uh, speaking of um, next week, we have another fascinating program for you. Brian Mason is the director of Name, Image, and Likeness Strategy for the University of Wisconsin. And you've been hearing a lot about that, right, with, with uh, college athletes. He's going to be telling us all about NIL and what it means for uh, college athletics. And uh, name, image, and likeness. Okay. And uh, we are going to, if you would stand, we're going to close out our meeting with the Rotary four-way test of the things we think, do, and say. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? We are adjourned. <laughs>